All right, hello everyone and welcome to the Networking Masterclass for April. This is the second session focusing on Americas. I'm your host, Dave Potter, and I'll be going through the webinar with you. So thank you for taking the time to join us this month for the Citrix Networking Masterclass. So before we get started, there's a few uh, housekeeping items I'd like to bring up. So first is that the audio for this webinar is available in two different forms. So if you're having trouble hearing us on voice over IP or perhaps on computer audio, there's the option to change it in the GoToWebinar panel. So if you go in there, uh, maybe if you're hearing me a little bit broken, it's possible that you may have some better success changing that either from phone call to computer audio or by dialing into a different number. So if you didn't see your preferred number in the invitation, you're welcome to view uh, additional numbers under the problem dialing in section to join with your local closest number. The second point is that we this webinar would not be the same without you and we really appreciate your, uh, your attendance. And we really encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. Um, we may not pause at every ideal moment to get your question, but we really do appreciate the interaction and the feedback. So whether you just have a comment or something you're thinking about, or if you have a legitimate question, we appreciate if you would go into the GoToWebinar control panel under questions and ask your question there. We'll also be using the questions panel for the final part of our webinar where we go over uh, the great prize for sticking around with our giveaway. If you have any questions that we can't get to through the webinar, you're welcome to email us at networkingmasterclass@citrix.com. And if you're unable to enjoy all of the content or perhaps you find the content ex you know, exciting enough that you want to share, um, that's great. We, we love that. And we are recording this session. So if you have to step away or perhaps you'd like to share some of the content from this session, rest assured that you can um, enjoy this webinar content and receive it after the call. So following this webinar, we will email out a link where you can play back the recording at your own leisure to reabsorb the content or perhaps share that content with some of your colleagues and friends. So who's with us today? So I'm your host, Dave Potter. I'm in the product management team onto the Citrix ADC product. And joining us today is Glenn Williams and Jason Poole talking to us about SD-WAN and the ITM products. So in terms of the overall agenda, we have quite a packed agenda today. So we've got two sections focusing on SD-WAN. So this is pretty exciting. So the first agenda topic is our 101 section fo focusing on the highlights of Office 365 and how it works with Citrix SD-WAN. Following on the optimizations of Office 365, we'll have a spotlight just dedicated to the SD-WAN orchestrator product. So this is brand new. I expect a lot of interaction and a lot of feedback because we've not introduced SD-WAN orchestrator to you before. Following those um, products and introductions from Glenn Williams, we'll have a follow-up with Jason Poole. You may have recognized Jason's name from a previous uh, masterclass. Jason joins us again, and he'll be talking about the ITM and Citrix ADC integration. Following that, I'll have some news and views, what's happening with Citrix, what's happening with the products, what are we doing in the summer months at Citrix. And then at the end, if you stick around long enough, we will have a prize giveaway. So the prize will be something interesting. In fact, um, I'll share that in just a moment. Rest assured, you'll be very happy with the prize if you stick around toward the end. So who's with us today? I always love this part because it really shares and shows the amount of attendance and the wide breadth of audience that we have joining us from around the globe. Today, because of this session is focused in the Americas region, joining us today is from uh, many people from Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, Brazil, Colombia, India, and the UK. We have a significant participation today in the America session from Canada and Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your attendance is much appreciated. And then it should go without saying that our large, largest audience today is from folks in the United States of America. So thank you for joining us from within our home country of the USA. So I mentioned the grand prize giveaway. We'll be handing this out at the end of the session. So if you stick around, we'll be asking a question from content of one of the sessions. And it won't be too complicated, but it will require a little bit of focus. So pay attention. And if you answer the prize or the question correctly at the end, you'll be eligible to win the prize here. So today's grand prize giveaway is the Nest 
Hello. This is a visual prize. It's very exciting for us. It's the first time we'll be giving away a Nest Hello, and um, you'll be eligible to win it if you pay attention throughout the webinar and answer the prize at the very end. So without ado, um, I'd like to kick off the very beginning, the 101 section of our webinar today. And this is Office 365 with Citrix SD-WAN. And joining us today is Glenn Williams. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and bring Glenn online. Glenn, are you with us? I certainly am, Dave. Thanks for that intro. That was, uh, that was great. If you want to pass over presenter to myself. Sure. We'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so let's get that up there and show my main screen. There we go. Hopefully, you can see my starting slide. So, yes. looks good. Forward from what I, I think very much. It's the best one of the lot, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, following on from what Dave said, my name's Glenn Williams. You can probably tell by the accent that uh, I'm based over in the United Kingdom. Um, I work in the solution architect team for SD WAN, so on the product management. So the first topic for this evening, um, and I've been told to keep to time today because I overran on the last session, so we'll be, uh, we'll be cascading through. So the first topic this evening is uh, 0365, or Office 365 to give it its full name, and how its interaction with Citrix SD-WAN. So without further ado, we'll start digging into the deck. So Citrix has got a long, illustrious lifespan with Microsoft, right? We've been friendly and working together for an awful long time now, right back as far as 1989 to be precise, which is just shortly after I left school, so it's quite a while ago. As we've been moving along the timeline, you can see that uh, SD-WAN working with Azure came out in July, and then followed by the ADC in September, and then Office 365 integration was November 2018. So the feature we're talking about today came in release 10.2 code of Citrix SD-WAN. It wasn't available before that. We kind of like uh, had a Azure virtual WAN on ramp before that, so we we're already integrating the SD-WAN with Azure prior. But this is when the API integration came into play. So Microsoft have always been running Office whether it be in your data center or in the more recent years has been migrating up until what's called Office 365, as in the cloud version. So what they did is they took a step back and they looked at how things were working. And they thought, well, we're moving things up into the cloud, but it's not so great for some people. Now, part of the problem was the fact that they had thousands of IP addresses and URLs linked to the different resourcing for Office 365, so different endpoints, basically. So what this was causing is a bit of latency as, as um, packets had to travel in lots of different directions to pull different bits of information. It's roughly about five TCP connections per application. So it's, it's quite a lot of streams going on. One of the biggest problems was the latency. So I thought, well, how can we address this? Right? How can we make things a bit better for customers? You know, we need to increase the performance and keep the footprint for the Office 365. So what they started to do is tear the network to pieces. So they broke it down into a few sections. Okay, So we've got three miles. It's obviously a lot more than three miles, to be honest, but um, we'll call it the last, middle, and first mile. So the last mile in this instance, right, is the bit between you and I and where it breaks out into the internet, okay? So we've got where we're sitting now, right in the second, and we've got the egress, so the breakout, and it's got a security stack in there. Now, you've got that first piece getting to the security stack. The security stack obviously causes some latency as it does its IDS, IPS, UTM, malware, anti-phishing, and looks through all the packets. After that, you've got the break from there to the ISP and the ISP to the point of presence. And then after that, you've got to travel through the network to get to your actual data, your tenant. So this can be very dispersed. So you could be sat, for instance, in New York. However, your data, your tenant is over on the other side in, let's just say, San Francisco. I'm just picking names here. So you can understand that there's going to be a lot of latency picked up. 
So what they started doing was understanding how they could address these factors with moving front doors, moving the data, things like that. So we're going to cover those points now. So Microsoft's got a, I'm not here to sell Microsoft, but a little bit of background is very useful and inf informative in these occurrences. So as of November 2018, 85% of 0365 customers are now less than 30 milliseconds from front door compared to previous year where you could probably say about 25% maybe were near front door. Now the reason behind this is because of the amount of partnerships which they've built themselves with ISPs, with moving front door locations and expanding their data centers. And all of these things are very, they're growing year on year. It's an organic growth as more and more users take and adopt to the 0365. So what we're gonna have here is a, it's a little demographic, little infogram that's gonna build out. And it's gonna help paint you a better picture on what we're talking about with latency, why there's a benefit to be able to get to the nearest front door, and even more so, why there's a true performance enhancement and benefit from instead of sending your traffic to the data center and breaking out that way, from breaking your data, your traffic out locally when trying to get to office. Furthermore, we'll come on to why Citrix for doing this. So the first way to look at this is the traditional legacy way of getting to your data, your Office 365 data. So let's just say we've got a couple of examples here. We've, we've kept it very US based. So we're sitting in San Francisco and we want to view our emails or pull down a file from OneDrive. So first of all, that has to, has to go to the data center in Atlanta. And then from Atlanta, it goes across the backbones. It goes to the point of presence, also in Atlanta. From there, it has to get to a service door. And then from there, you get down to your data. So as you can see, that's 65 milliseconds it's taken to do that. Well, that's quite a long time, really. I mean, inside your head, 65 milliseconds isn't very long, right? It's, uh, even a second doesn't seem very long. But in the world of bits and bytes and, and pushing packets around in the ether, that's a very long time, to be honest. So what we see here now is we just build out the picture a little bit more, and we've got the ISP links added in. Now, what happens if we... Instead of sending the traffic back to the data center, what happens if we, you know, break it out directly from the branch to a point of presence, which is in San Jose? So San Francisco, San Jose, I think is roughly about 30 miles, 40 miles, maybe something like that is a big difference compared to San Francisco and Atlanta. I know that for sure, um, which Atlanta's my geography is not that great, but I think it's over towards the east sort of direction. So by doing that. What we've now done is we've got a path from the branch to San Jose and from there to a service front door, which is in this case somewhere near Seattle, and then to your data. Now, Microsoft are constantly monitoring customers, they're constantly monitoring traffic paths and flows and trying to understand what's going on. And based on that data, they can make decisions as to where to place these front doors. They can move them, okay? They can change their points of presence and they can move the data. So in this graphic, we can see here what we've just built out. You can see it's taken 25 milliseconds. So I think we can agree that 25 is definitely better than 65. What if we move the front door a little bit closer? Okay, so instead of being down to other directions, we've got a front door closer to San Jose. Furthermore, we can see that that takes us down to five milliseconds. But what happens if we bring the data a bit closer? All of a sudden, you know, that five milliseconds is split down even further, granular, right? So we've gone from 65 milliseconds going out legacy through the data center and then round. We're coming all the way down to five milliseconds now. I think that's going to make a, in fact, I know that's going to have a huge impact on searches, for instance, on Outlook. So if you want to search for a colleague or something to find out what emails have been sending you, or maybe you want to pull a file down, there's some, Let's just say this this meeting, once it's recorded, it was put up into OneDrive by uh, by one of your colleagues and you need to pull it down. You want that to be quite quick. You don't want to sit there for 30 minutes. And in England, we typically sit down and have a cup of tea and wait for it to come through. So you don't want to necessarily be drinking cups of tea all day waiting for your files to come through. So let's have a look at that in another way. What happens if we've got to go from San Francisco to Atlanta to Washington, D.C. to hit the front door? 
to get to our data. All of a sudden, oh my God, it's 85 milliseconds. So I think you can get the idea of the picture we're building out here to see that the best way to increase the performance and the, the user experience is to break out locally, right? And the way to do that, we can do that by using what we call the Microsoft principles. So they came up with these connectivity principles, right? These, these ideas from analyzing and speaking to customers and, and generally looking at some analytics. They came up with, well, you know, let's, let's optimize the O365 traffic. For starters, Office 365 is already well encrypted, okay? So we don't necessarily need those cumbersome security stacks to look at all of the packets before they go out. So great, we can send it out and break it out locally. You know, next thing we need to do is minimize the network latency. So as we've just seen in the infographic a minute ago, instead of backhauling it through the data center, let's, let's break it out locally indeed. Right? So we've minimized the latency there. So what we're doing is we're, we're building a bigger picture for not just O365, but this is going to expand for other SaaS moving forward some time. So I touched on at the start and I said there are thousands of endpoints to start off with when they started this exercise and they were constantly moving targets. IPs and URLs were changing all the while and it was, it was very difficult to keep on top of these things. Believe it or not now, they, they've managed to get that down to roughly around about 10 endpoints, okay? So I think, you know, it's, it's quite a considerable reduction there. We can agree on that one. And of those 10 endpoints, uh, that actually accounts for around about 75 to 75 to 80, 85 percent of Office 365 bandwidth consumption. So on the optimized, the, the nice green box on the left hand side there, that kind of represents the traffic which we feel needs the lowest latency, right? So we're talking about your know, VoIP traffic is extremely, you know, Teams or Skype for Business, it was, it was once known and still is known. Right. We can't have too much latency, otherwise we end up with clipping calls, we have jitter, you know, we have these conferences going on which are just unmanageable and it's just disgusting. It's not very nice to work with. Moving slightly to the right, we have something called the allow list. Okay, and these are these are applications which are still, you know, they're still required, but it's not quite so sensitive to the latency. We can Set, separate them out slightly. And then further down on the right hand side, we have what's known as default. Okay. And as it quite rightly states there on the fourth line, you know, it might not necessarily be in Microsoft data centers. So, you know, it's not something you necessarily need to break out. Now, the beauty of the Citrix SD1 solution is we've actually consumed these categories so that you can make a decision yourself as to which categories you want to break out locally and directly. Obviously, you're going to go for optimize straight away. Allow and default, you can make a decision on what you want to do with. We typically put them all in and send them all out. And we can do this on a first packet um, decision. Now, the reason we can do that is we have um, the API with Microsoft. Okay, so they've got this API, it's, it's published, you can search it on the internet and find out some more information on it. With this API, the Citrix SD-WAN appliance will pull down a database daily, okay? Most of the UIPs and URLs won't change, but they do change from time to time, so we do need to keep these things up to date. With that database, when we get the requests come in, we can now steer those off to the nearest front door. Now, how do we steer them to the nearest front door? You know, if we've got to send the DNS requests to the data center, the data center is going to do his DNS lookup and he's going to pick the nearest front door to where he is. Okay, that's, that's not going to work, right? It's, it, we're breaking the methodology we've been talking about all along. So what we do is we do local DNS lookups, okay, on the SD-WAN appliance. So when the packets come in now, when we do a DNS lookup to try and find the nearest front door, we get the nearest front door to that branch not the nearest front door to the data center. Another thing to mention with this is this is all 
I want to say automated, automatic. So you're able to, from the SD-WAN controller, right, the MCN or orchestrator, you're able to create a policy to decide what you want to break out and push that out to all of your sites. So there's no need to log into lots of individual appliances. So let's say you've got a, let's say you've got 200 branch sites. You don't have to log into 200 branch sites and configure them. You can create a policy at a global level and then push it out to all of your appliances so that they're all singing from the same hem sheet, so to speak. They're all breaking out locally. And furthermore, just to touch on that, you can see that we have some traffic here, which is low priority, and it's 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 not 0365 traffic or it's untrusted 0365 traffic. What we can do with that is because we have that policy in place, we have something called application routing. So we can make a decision on the appliance to steer off this 0365, you know, the optimize and allow stuff, and then maybe default and all other traffic that you may need to backhaul up to the data center. I mean, let's be honest, we haven't migrated everything to the cloud yet. The ideal world is everything will go up there. All of our SaaS will go there one day, but there's still stuff living in the data center. We still have the capabilities to steer stuff down what we call the virtual path down to the data center so that it can still have the security stack um, verifications and we can still reach um, applications down there as well. So I guess the question, the million dollar question always is why Citrix, SD-WAN, Office? Well, number one, because we have this API integration, right? That's, that's, that's gonna be a fast way to market, you know, to break out your Office 365, you know, to get it to the nearest front door, to enhance your user experience and gain those benefits quickly. By leveraging the API, you can do that. That inherently brings together two and three, right? Any CEO is going to agree that if you can improve the user experience, productivity is going to grow as well. If productivity grows, then more is being done. So instead of having your eight hour working day, okay, that's an ideal world. But if you worked an eight, eight hour uh, day and you're spending 30 minutes of that day waiting for traffic or your, your data to come down from 0365 when you could be working, you've already earned yourself. 30 minutes of a day of productivity. Now, those are just numbers I'm making up in my head, to be honest. I don't have any statistical data, but you can kind of understand why you would use the 0365 API, especially with Citrix, so that we have that integration. So here's an example. I apologize, it's EMEA based, so the famous London and Dublin. I did have an opportunity to pull together an American one um, in the time I had, but this is something you can run on your own laptop, okay? It's quite an interesting little test. It doesn't take very long to do. You can run a trace route or trace cert if you're using Windows to the outlook.office365.com location. What it will come back with is it will show you the first breakout point, okay? So in this case, it's London. What it will then show you is where the exchange server is. It's in Dublin. So the distance between L London and Dublin is actually very minimal. It's a tiny piece of water compared to the States. So what you can see here is how it's picked the nearest pot and then gone in through to get to the traffic. Now, if you looked at this without using the SD-WAN or the API functionality, you would see that it may hit London, but then go to Amsterdam, for instance, if that's where it's going to try and get to its nearest front door. Or if it's going up to the data center, the data center could be geographically different. It could be somewhere in Germany, for instance. So you have a, a greater latency there. Now, something else which needs to be mentioned, I mean, there's two points to gain from this slide. Number one, you have the additional benefit with being able to create the virtual path and aggregate links together to give you higher bandwidth with the SD-WAN appliance and apply QoS. But with the topic of the Office 365, we have the ability within the HDX, which is typically, for those of you on the call who know the VDI, VDA, it's typically rendered server-side. With Teams or Skype for Business, we have the capability to do that on the client side. 
what that means then is because the traffic is on client side we have the ability to use the api again and send it out to office 365 instead of it being from server side again geographically different potentially and then going up to office 365 you've got the latency of going from branch through the pipes to the data center and then reaching your traffic and fetching it back so again this isn't only something which citrix can do with the HTX traffic. Okay, it's our protocol. So moving swiftly on, I have a short video, which I'm gonna play for you, okay? Um, which is a bit of an example of what's going on. I'll give you a bit of a talk through, we'll just play it a moment. I'll wait for that to move out of the way. Whoops, let's just click that back. Um, there we go, sorry about that. Clicked in the wrong place. So let's just wait for that to play through. So this tool is called the Skype for Business Network Assessment Tool. It's free to download. Essentially what it does is it creates a 17 second um, voice call, okay? Now, what we can see in this instance here is we've got egress from DC and local internet breakout. And you can see there's a little graphic here and it's got a cute little bubble that moves along to show you what's going on. But more importantly, what we can see here is when we break out directly to the DC, we've got an RTT of around about, it's 297. I think there had been a little bit fair up here and saying 200. And we have an average jitter around about 95. So we can see that this isn't too great. Now, what we're going to see now is one of the Citrix employees. He's going to have a search through his Outlook, trying to find some emails from one of his colleagues. And then he's going to try and download a file. So let's see what happens when it breaks out from the data center. So it's being backhauled. So here's our file. Okay, selecting that. That's the demo deck, which he wants to pull down. Okay, starts that off and he looks at that and it's, what is it, 5.1 kilobytes per second? It's going to take 36 minutes to pull this down, which is quite unbelievable, really. Now he's going to search for somebody in his Outlook. So he's looking from Sandeep and he's waiting for that to come through. It says searching, he's still waiting for that information to come through. And you see the little bubble traversing and going out of the data center. Now what we'll do is we'll break out locally using the API, okay? And already I think you can see it's, it's 13 milliseconds with seven milliseconds of jitter, okay? So we'll repopulate this little uh, table in a moment. You can watch the little bubble, he'll be going up and down. And what we're gonna do is do the same as what we did before. We're gonna download that file and we're gonna do a search in our Outlook so that we can see what the performance improvement is in a real sort of like tangible method. So let's, let's just populate that information. There it is there, it goes up on the top. So here comes that file again, he's gonna search for his demo deck and oh, he's got 67 kilobytes this time and it's gonna take three minutes instead of 31. So I think that's one less cup of tea already that, uh, that he's going to be taking. We can see the dot going up and down here. Beautiful. He did that search and literally, if you blink, you miss it. It was that quick that he did his search and came through. So going back to what we previously said, this is improving the user experience. It's improving productivity. You know, I mean, we've all sat there waiting for files to download unnecessarily. You can get on and get get on and do other tasks but if you need that file right now it's a bit frustrating and in the words of microsoft the outlook experience was dreadful and aggressing from the dc and delightful when breaking out from locally so you can see here how the api has improved everything so moving forward swiftly we can see this we'll just put it into some hard and fast numbers i mean different people, different things, right? Um, the upload speeds and download speeds, we can see the difference there. I mean, there's, there's up to 5X upload and 10X download. And I think we saw that with the file download. Okay, it was, it was um, done in a lab when we did it, but that is real world measurements. And you can see based on Word and PowerPoint, PowerPoint documents are obviously a lot heavier than Word documents. So, you know, it's, it takes a bit longer. But for Teams and Skype for Business, better call quality, second to none, better call quality, no clipping. So we're coming up to the final couple of slides on here. I'm just gonna throw out a poll quickly, um, just to get some info back, just for my own knowledge more than anything else, to see how relevant this information has been. So the first question on this poll is, 
are you using or moving to only 365 cloud services like now or in the near future? Well, these are fantastic numbers. Okay, I'll let that run for another 10 seconds. So fastest fingers first. It's like uh, the X factor or whatever. Maybe not that exciting. Um, okay, that's great. So I'm just going to close that off now. I think those are rough numbers. Yep, perfect. So let's just ping that up and have a look. So no big surprises there, really, right? As I said at the start, the legacy world of having everything in your data center is is, is fading away slowly but surely. So it's no surprise that we've got 71% there who are already up in the cloud and already using 0365. And we've got 30% there who haven't started thinking about it yet. Um, it's, it's definitely worth thinking about. You know, it's, um, the benefits uh, can be reaped very, very quickly from, from using the technology. So let's just hide that one. Um, and for those of you out there, let's let's do these in an opposite direction, actually. Um, first, let's understand if you're using 0365, are you backhauling through a central data center if you're using 0365? So let's, let's try and keep this to the ones who are using 0365. I don't want to, I don't want to sideline you 30% at the moment. I'm just trying to get some information just for my own knowledge bank at the moment. Oh God, this is an interesting split. Very interesting. So I'm just going to close the poll, counting down five, four, three, two, one. Oh, I couldn't make that up if I tried. Look at this. 50-50. There we go. So that's, that's, that's very interesting to see. So you'll see why this is in the moment, this, this next question, why I wanted to understand this a little bit better. So this is the third and final question for this topic. Okay, and then I promise you we'll move on to the last slide and get onto the new technology. So for those of you who are doing this and you're going through the data centers, how's your performance and your audio call qualities at the moment? You know, are you experiencing any issues? Okay, so this is an interesting, yep, okay. So let's count down again, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's close that off. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it, guys, for your interaction on this one. So we have 30% which are back on, well, we've got 30% which are having performance and call issues, 36 are not, and then we've got the 35 there who are not using 0365 five uh, services today. Okay, so that's interesting. I mean, certainly the top one there, the ones which say yes, let's have a conversation, right? And see what we can do, you know, about um, improving that with SD-WAN, okay? The ones which are saying no, okay, I mean, it's, it's all uh, perceptive, I guess, isn't it, as to what good and bad is, but it's still worth having the conversation. And the guys who are not using 0365, Let's see what happens in the near future with that one, I think. Um, whether or not you stick where you are or whether you move forwards, it's certainly worth researching. Um, I'm not saying today, tomorrow, but you know, in the next six to 12 months. So let me close that off and uh, I'll give you the last slide. So the last slide is, um, it's an interesting one. Okay, so we talked about the SD-WAN there. Um, we talked about it in the appliance format. We have um, some instances whereby, you may have a benefit, or you could well have a benefit, by putting the SD-WAN up into Azure. So the Citrix SD-WAN, not only is it a physical appliance, it's also a virtual appliance, um, and it can also be deployed in AWS, Azure, and GCP coming up. So we can deploy into the cloud. In this instance, we've got in Azure, we're talking about here. Um, if you were to have the SD-WAN on premises as an appliance, you could also have it up in the cloud. What that's going to provide you is the ability to, um, if you've just got an MPLS circuit today, you could augment that circuit with some cheaper, more commodity ISP links. So uh, we call them broadband in the UK, I guess. So if you had like a 10 meg link and a 50 meg, let's keep the numbers simple, and you put them together with two SD-WAN appliances, 
you've got 60 meg to play with okay and the solution can then use those links to the best of its abilities so we can apply qos to the different traffic which is traversing up and down that virtual path so prioritization of you know your real-time traffic against file transfers and have a little bit more granularity on it and as it says there brownouts links have problems whether you like it or not it doesn't matter if it's mpls or whether it's it's an isp link they do have issues sd wan is a good way of hiding that it will always give you this always on approach so i hope that piece of information has been useful for you about 0365 and just to wrap it up into a summary it's uh, it's the ability for the appliance to pull down via api the list of ips and urls with local DNS in order to provide you the quickest route to a front door to reach your data. So we can reduce that potential 85 milliseconds latency down to five milliseconds latency. And we've seen in the video there that, you know, searching an Outlook, a lot more responsive, pulling down a file 10 times faster pretty much, right? So I think we've seen the benefits there. Um, it's certainly worth investigating available in 10.2 so if you have citrix sd1 already today it's worthwhile getting up to the latest code release 10.2 if you don't have citrix sd1 have a conversation try and understand a little bit more about what sd1 is how it can help your business right how it can not just in work with office but you know it's got a rich dpi it can do a lot of clever things so thank you very much for listening to that one what I'm going to do now is quickly switch PowerPoint presentations. What I could have done really is bundle them up into one presentation. That would have been clever, wouldn't it? But um, at this time of the evening, I'm not that clever, to be honest. It's what time is it? So, Glenn, it's before we jump to the next one, there's a couple of uh, lingering questions. You know, and I think it, it wraps up on your final um, statement there, yeah, which sure. is um, one of the questions is, how does the technology Office 365 and SD-WAN apply to hybrid environments? And the second okay. of that is a question about, so if I already default route everything to the internet, how does this really help with my situation? Okay, so yeah, two good questions there. So with a hybrid cloud, um, you're going to be storing your applications in different areas. We have the ability to deploy into multiple clouds. So as I mentioned there, you could have, and typically why we're using multi-cloud these days or hybrid multi-cloud as it's coined is more of a resiliency and redundancy type of thing. You know, you're not going to stick all of your applications in one rack in the data center if that falls over you need a disaster recovery so you know you're using aws and azure for instance wherever your office is being hosted we can either a put appliances virtual appliances there to give you that speed or we'll still hit the nearest front door to be able to access that for you i hope that answers that piece um the second part of that is i already pipe everything out to the internet i believe was was the was what you said this will bring us back to the original point of, even though you're not back all into the data center, if you pump it straight out of uh, directly, you're still not necessarily gonna get to the nearest front door. You're gonna get to whatever front door is decided upon by your DNS lookup. You know, it's not necessarily going to have that API information in order to do that. So we can provide that level of, uh, of intelligence, so to speak, to steer you off the nearest front door and uh, increase the uh, increase the performance um, benefits from that. Fantastic. And then a quick follow up is how does SD-WAN compare to using Microsoft Express routes? <laughs> That's a very good question, one which comes up a lot as well. So, dare I say it, Microsoft Express Route's expensive, okay? Um, the two technologies can live side by side. So, you know, they both do a similar sort of function. Express Route is just a direct pipe straight up into uh, Azure. What you can do is use the SD-WAN with Express Route with the commodity internet so you can augment your express route so you've got that expensive express route you can almost think of it like an mpls circuit right which is again quite pricey bring in some commodity internet and bundle them together so they kind of complement each other really you could ultimately do away with the express route which we have a, had a quite a few customers do actually and just go over to the sd-wan world okay yep perfect fantastic thanks glenn
I think we're ready to go. Next? Thanks for pulling me up, Dave. I do get onto a bit of a tangent and I do go 10 guns sometimes. So please, anybody, just, just pull me in, rein me in if you need to. So um, the next topic, which is one which is very close to my heart, is the orchestrator. Um, so I'm just going to pop up a poll straight away because this helps me set the scene uh, for where I go with this. OK, it's a very simple question and it is. Do you have SD WAN deployed today in the context of Citrix? Okay, so this is a complete flip of what I had for EMEA, which is very interesting. Yep, exact flip. Okay, so we've only got 40% of you voting. So um, you know, the more the more data points we've got, the more. Okay, let's close that down in a moment. So five, four, three, two, one, closing the doors. Okay, I'm going to share the results for that because it's an interesting one. Um, we've got 23% here, which you've got SD-WAN deployed today. So the topic which we're going into, um, let me just hide that off a moment, right? The topic we're going into, okay, let's put up this one as well. This wasn't a question I used on the last um session but i'm going to use it for this so this is kind of like in the context of because we had so many say that they weren't didn't have sd wan i'm wondering if you were thinking about sd wan if you'd be going for a managed service so this is just the it's me putting the feelers out there a little bit and trying to find out one of my colleagues is on this master class at the moment who works with msps i think this probably help her quite a bit as well um okay so i'm going to count this down so it's five four three two one okay so let's share the results on that one okay so 40 percent there would come would um consider using uh an msp a managed service provider to do this this is kind of like for those who don't want to manage you don't manage your wan routers today why are you going to manage your sd wan it's that type of um, formula and way forwards and we do see that a lot as well over in EMEA to be honest um, no so I, I don't know if that's in the context of those who haven't SD-WAN or not considering SD-WAN or if they're looking to maybe DIY which is quite a common use case as well whereby you buy your SD-WAN solution you deploy it yourself you manage it yourself you know and that's for people who have got quite a bit of infrastructure so I'm going to dive in on this one um, so we have today a product within Citrix for SD-WAN for management called the SD-WAN Center okay um, I'm not going to dwell on it too much because it's quite clear by the numbers that most of the audience won't have heard of it before so it's it's fine the SD-WAN Center is an on-premises solution okay so it lives in your data center um, you're responsible for the patch, the upkeep, CICD, you know, those sorts of sides of the house. This solution here is cloud hosted by Citrix, right? So it's part of the Citrix cloud, which you may already have access to for some of the other services which Citrix provide, and it's hosted up there. So that means that we are responsible for patching it, uh, for developing the new features and pushing it out. You don't actually have to do anything. You just consume it as a service, okay? So SD-WAN from the context of Citrix um, is the ability of being able to give you better performance of your applications, okay? By aggregating bandwidth. So you can see in this bubble here, where MPLS, Internet, Satellite, and 4G LTE. So what it will do is it will take those links and instead of having some links standby, back up, waiting to be used in disaster, we take all of those links and we put them together into what's known as a virtual path. So it means the platforms then become a little bit resilient to um, brownouts, blackouts. So let's say you've got these links and your MPLS circuit dies for whatever reason, or the builders are outside and they cut through your internet link you still have all of that bandwidth to play with, okay? Um, we also do a per packet system, so we're a lot different to other vendors in that respects. 
Now, I'm going to have to talk about the orchestrator as we dive through. Um, I will try and touch on SD WAN as we go. Okay, so these pretty little blue boxes here would be your SD WAN appliances. Okay, and what the orchestrator does is talk to these guys as a central point of configuration. So typically, you're going to have routers at site, uh, firewalls at site, and you have to manage all of these devices individually. That can be Become a real pain. Let's say, for instance, you need to set up some IPsec tunnels. We know, well, I know personally, it takes me about 15 to 20 minutes to set up an IPsec tunnel. Maybe it's just because I've got slow fingers, but it takes me quite a while. Meanwhile, when you've got a central management point, you can do all of this and then push it out to all of the appliances without having to actually dial into each one of them individually. So it gives you like that single pane of glass, single management portal. You know, it aggregates everything together. They kind of have a term in the EMEA where they say it's a, it's a single throat to choke. So you just go to one place if you've got a problem, essentially. So as you can see here, I mean, the appliances, the dependencies are to have an IP address, a gateway and DNS. It's as simple as that, right? It's as simple as that. Obviously, you've got a little bit here where you need to connect in your WAN links, okay? But for the orchestrator to do his magic, that's what he needs. So essentially, what you can do is you can ship an appliance to site, okay? So you buy some boxes. The box gets to site and you say to the guy who's on site, you know, he may not be too tech savvy. You say, hey, Bob, can you plug in the appliance, please, and connect the management cable into the yellow port, right? Access 192.168.100.10 and give it an IP address. Or even better still, you might have DHCP on that site. Once you've got that information, what happened is this box will go, ah, OK, great. Now, what should I do? So he starts calling home and he starts calling to this orchestrator service. And he says, oh, hello, mate. I've been told in my code that when I wake up, I can call home and I can speak to you. And the orchestrator says, oh, very good. OK, so welcome to the family. And he joins in. Now, in the interim before this, what we've done is we've built a configuration on the orchestrator. And what we do is we build a configuration on a site by site basis. OK. What we've done is we've simplified that somewhat and we've created the um, idea of templates. So you can create site templates. Let's think of this as small, medium and large. So you may have a small template for I don't know, a shop, OK, a retail place, or you may have a large template for the data center. OK, so these templates are reusable. So you can kind of like build out your, your site templates and your WAN templates and then inherit them into the sites. So we've tried to streamline this process as much as possible. Once we've built our configuration, we can then go through the deployment. So we do a verification, a staging, and an activation process, which we'll touch on in a moment. Now, the only thing which is really required by the orchestrator, once the appliance has started talking to him, he just needs to know that he's bona fide. Right? He needs to know that he's going to be given the configuration to the right person. So IP address is one thing, but it's not very uh, it's not very unique right you need a unique identifier for that what we have is a serial number okay every appliance has a unique serial number if it's a piece of hardware a piece of metal it's going to be on your packaging it's stamped on the box you know you've got it there if it's a virtual appliance which is obviously not something tangible you can't really well there's nothing to look at really is it it's just a piece of software Every time an appliance comes up, it gets a unique serial number from the UUID. OK, so we need that information for the orchestrator. So there's a couple of screenshots here. You've got one with the serial number and here you've got the IP address and DNS, which is required. OK, so those are the two bits over here. We have LTE. Now, moving forwards at the moment, the orchestrator works via the or via the, uh, the management port of the appliance. Moving forwards, it will work over the LTE. So what that means is you could ship an appliance to site and you simply just plug in a SIM card, power it on and Bob's your uncle. It will start talking home, ready for its configuration file. So as I said, we've got the ability to create these profiles. OK, so there's profiles QoS, which is the one which we're touching on. Right. So we've got a big um, DPI engine inside our appliance. It's um, 
I think at the moment it's over 4,500 applications that we have inside our DPI engine. So we can act on all of those and, you know, break some out locally, send some down the uh, virtual path or use the firewall. So there's a stateful firewall where we could allow, drop, deny um, applications as well. So you may want to uh, see block uh, social media like uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at the branch because it's consuming too much bandwidth, you know, those sorts of things. So we have the different profiles there in place. The different configuration steps that can be used, you know, each of this is available to an end customer. So the orchestrator today is available to partners, MSPs, okay? But in May, middle of May, this is gonna be available to CSAs and end customers, okay? So you'll be able to consume it directly. You won't necessarily have to go through a managed service provider. I have to drop that in there. So this is like the template format that we have in order to step through, okay? So what we've done, we've streamlined it. I mean, echoing back to Microsoft, it's not based around Microsoft, but it's a similar sort of, we've all installed an application at some point, and it's kind of like a, you sit there and you just go next, 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 as you step through. We've done a very similar sort of streamlined process for you, like that, whereby these tabs here, so you've got the site details, device details, and other metrics or parameters which are required. Each time you finish with one, click next, and it'll take you to the next, take you to the next, so you get to the summary, you can look at the summary tab and then that's it, you're ready to deploy. It works on a zero touch provisioning service, as I mentioned, okay? So once the serial number is up inside, you've retrieved it from the appliance, you've put it up into the orchestrator to the relevant site. What we can do next is we can do something called verification, make sure we've done nothing silly. I've done it multiple times and the, the, salute, the service lets you know you've made mistakes as so you can go back and rectify them before you break anything. Next, you stage. By staging, what it does is it pushes the, uh, the software version if you're doing an upgrade, plus the configuration files, down to the appliance, ready. And then what we do is an activation. Once we do the activation, it puts the configuration in place, ready to go, and brings everything online. So let's quickly step through some of the reports. So we've got inventory, okay? So we can go in and have a look at our portfolio, have a look at the estate and see how many uh, appliances we've got deployed out there. We can have a look at the serial numbers. We can have a look at the bandwidth which has been associated to them as well. So you don't have to, that's another thing. You don't have to go into each and every appliance and apply a license. That's all done from the orchestrator. He licenses the appliances for you. So you don't have to worry about that sort of side of things. We have alerts which all bubble up, okay? So you can dial into the orchestrator and you can see it's all color coded. You know, you've got reds and oranges and greens or rag as I like to call it. You know, red is high, orange medium, green is low. And we can see what all of the alarms are. And these are all fully filterable, okay? So you can configure how many sort of like high alerts you get and things like that. We have the device logs, okay? So the device logs are uh, held on the device. They're not all pulled up to the cloud. It's, uh, it's a window to see in what logs there are available for troubleshooting. You can click on one of the logs and then download it to your local machine. So the machine I'm using here, my Mac, I could pull back the files onto my laptop. Furthermore, what we have, the concept of the overlay and the underlay. Now the overlay is the virtual path I mentioned, so that's the aggregation of the links, the MPLS, the internet, and things like that, the LTE satellite, and the underlay is the actual links themselves. Whoops, she's stepping through, there we go is the actual links themselves. So what we would hope to see is an uptime of 100% for the overlay. So what that means is traffic's been processed as normal. We haven't been losing packets or anything like that. Well, I say losing packets, that's a bad thing to say, that packets get lost, right? But what I mean to say is application traffic has been flowing, okay? What we do with the appliances, we pick the best path at that moment in time to put the packets onto. So if we see a degradation on one of the underlay paths, so the MPLS or internet, let's say we're using the MPLS circuit that starts degrading, we will automatically start using the internet path 
without any manual intervention whatsoever. So we can see here in this graphic that the overlay has been up 100% of the time, but the underlay 83%. So there's obviously been some problems underneath, but from the perspective of the applications, it's been up all the time. So stepping into the view here, what we can see is from a virtual path view, we've got some metrics, latency, loss, jitter and throughput. That's from the virtual path view. We can step down into that. We have the virtual path, but as I mentioned, here's orange and here's some MPLS queues. So we can see what's been actually happening. Now it's quite surprising actually, the amount of customers who don't realize they've got any problems with their links until they deploy a solution like this. And once they've deployed this, we've got a customer right at this moment in time, it's a building contract, a construction company in the UK. They've plugged this in, they found out they've got 9% loss on their internet link. So they've obviously raised a ticket with the ISP provider who they have, and that's going down a path now for resolution. So they've actually been paying for a service which they haven't been getting. By deploying the Citrix SD WAN, they've found this problem. Hopefully, you should be getting what they're paying for moving forwards. We have a usage trending graph here. So we have the ability to dial in and um, look at the applications. Obviously with the DPI engine, we have the ability to bubble up all of these applications and give you an idea of who's consuming bandwidth. Based on this information, you can then decide whether to, referring back to the social media thing, you might look in here and go, oh, hang on a minute. We've got site 57 and they've got a problem with bandwidth. We're gonna have to increase. Well, hang, let's have a look at the application. Oh, there's a lot of Facebook and Instagram and stuff going over that wire. So either let's break it out locally onto a commodity internet link or let's block it completely. Let's drop it at source. Okay, so it's very good for making business decisions like that. So just a quick example. Okay, so if you were a provider, an MSP, you would have a vision like this. So it's a multi-tenant solution. So you can have multiple customers on the single portal. Okay. You can see the red, amber, green. So you can see this guy's green. Everything's great at that site. You have the red one here. You've got some serious problems you need to go and address. And you've got this gray box here. Now, the gray box means inactive. Okay, so actually in this instance of XYZ, or XYZ, it is a site which hasn't actually been deployed yet or a customer hasn't been deployed. We've created the configuration, but we haven't actually pushed it down. Furthermore, we have a, a beautiful dashboard, okay? And this beautiful dashboard is color coordinated again. Um, we can see problematic sites. So red means problem, okay? Green means everything's great. And gray is the inactive ones which haven't been deployed as of yet. We can see the virtual path establishment. So again, it's the links between appliances. There's a head end device, which is this one here the MCN, and then you've got the branch devices which all connect back. So think of this as your data center potentially, and think of this as your individual sites, which could be split out geographically into regions. Some more health information. So that's that. So let me just pause this moment. Dave, if you wanna chime in at all, I'm just gonna flip over to uh, an orchestrator and pull that up, just to quickly show that it's not just slideware. Um, it is actually product. So showing screen two. So hopefully we can see that Looking, now. Yeah, looks good. Is that good? Is that great? Okay, so we're on. So in the interest of time, I'll skip through quickly. Okay, uh, the previous session I did a deployment, but it consumed a lot of time, unfortunately. So this is the provider view. Okay, you can see it's slightly different to the screenshots because this is my own personal setup. I have a customer here called um, Hextech. Okay, he's got 13 sites at the moment because he's got regions and the likes of. So we can quickly look at that guy before we go into the masterclass one, just as you can see the the map a little bit more populated. So you can see here that you've got a lot of sites all split over different areas. So that would be one customer. Then if you went into another customer, and this is what the MSP would be able to do, jump around like this. If you're the end user, then you would obviously just see your own customer. So this is your dashboard view, okay? So you get a great view of what's going on and where your sites are. 
Um, so yeah, as, as you can see, you've got all of your different sites. There's only three on this, for the interest of time I set this up. We have a program in the UK called Blue Peter back in the day. They used to say, here's one I made earlier. So if we go down into the configuration, okay, what we can see here is these sites are all inactive at the moment because the serial numbers haven't been loaded in. Once the serial numbers were loaded in, this cloud connectivity will change to online. It just means that I know who you are and the management IP address will be populated. So we'll just quickly step down into one of the sites just so that I can show you about slides, how it builds out. Now we've got this little green box over here on the right hand side. Think of them as your appliance, okay? So your appliance will have multiple ports. Let's show you a better one actually. So let's go to London. There we go, that's a bit more interesting. So the appliance here in London, he has four interfaces which are being used, okay? And as you can see, he's got an MPLS in number two, he's got the internet in number three, this is just commodity broadband, and he's got an LTE modem that he's plugging into number four. Now, I, I just have to ask, answer that um, we have an appliance which is called 210 LTE, which has a built-in modem, so you just put in a SIM card and it's got LTE functionality. So you don't have to plug in external devices, it's a fully consolidated box with the firewall as well. So it's a perfect box for, uh, for sites. So what you do is you select the appliance. There's the 210 I've just referenced, okay? You select the edition which you're using. So we have three different editions. If you want to follow up with one of the Citrix um, SE people, they can give you some more information on the capabilities of the different uh, appliances. We have a branch or MCN, and most importantly, bandwidth you know how much bandwidth is going to be allocated to this appliance and what that is is the amount of bandwidth on the WAN side again as I say click next there it is what we would do there is we we'll put in the serial number okay so just quickly we'll pop into this box here just while he's there I won't go through the full process but just to show you where it lives so he'll just whoops it's getting late and I'm getting hungry there we go, let's put that in. Can't think straight when you're hungry, can you? So there's the serial number C. So the first page you log into, you're instantly presented with this information. And by the way, this is this is a brand new virtual appliance. It's got no identity. There's the serial number you would take to put into the SD-WAN orchestrator. What we do then is we configure the interfaces. So if we just click into an interface at the moment, we have the ability to choose a deployment mode, okay? So whether it's Edge, Edge is a consolidation story, so you can remove your firewall, you plug your WAN links directly into the appliance itself. We have inline fail to wire and fail to block. So fail to wire is, if you have ports one and two, they have an electrical connection. So if the appliance fails, you've got redundancy and resiliency because the two pieces of wire just bridge together. Okay, so in the instance of bridge here, you can see that if there was a failure, bridge, those two interfaces would bridge. You put in your IP address, okay, and move on. From a WAN link status, okay, we'll just pop into one of these chaps here. We choose the access type, so public internet, private intranet, an intranet is an MPLS circuit where we're not employing the queues, okay. A category. Okay, a category and a name, and then we give it some IP addressing information, and we've got other advanced features that we can put in. And finally, when we come to the end, we have the summary page. Okay, now the summary page is a good way of identifying any issues. You've typically got a design similar to this one drawn out. What you can do is reference back to the design, and you can understand that you've got the correct IP addresses, the correct ports, and all the information required nailed down to start off with. Different people have different information. I've worked with some customers where you ask them what the IP address is gonna be for the MPLS circuit, they'll respond with, it's all in my head, which is always interesting for fault finding when that person's off sick, compared to I've just been handed a 25 page document, which is a full deployment, ready for reading, which will take you half a day, but it's good to have that information. So flipping back over here, we've got our summary. Once we're finished, we just click done and we're ready. 
okay so you would do that for each of your sites you would go through each site and build it out now it looks like there's quite a bit of information to put in but in reality you can as i mentioned go in and you can create your profiles okay so there's all of these profiles that can be built you can go in and create policies application firewall policies for instance and then you can go in and create groups service sets and information like that so as you can see it's a it's a one-stop shop you know you've got your reports that you can click into because we haven't deployed the the appliances yet it's going to have no information in here for the reporting aspect but again please reach out to your your se within citrix if you've got one if you haven't then you know please reach in and, and find out some more information and uh, i'm sure the team would be more than happy to give you a demonstration with fully populated data okay so in the interest of time i've tried to touch on various subjects here that i could with the orchestrator i need to hand over to jason in a moment dave yes glenn i'm gonna stop there because i'm well known for going off on a tangent and consuming hours and hours and hours so if there's any questions i'll field those before handing over to jason paul to clean up perfect so there is a one question that that stands out and and the question is is citrix partnering partnering with any major isps for them to provide both network service and managed sd wan yeah, that's, that's a good question, right? Um, if you want to send in an email, yes, we have had an active program going over the past um, period of time where we've been getting a list of MSPs signed up. So we do have MSPs ready and good to go um, to deliver the SD-WAN service. So please reach in to us and we'll uh, have a conversation and see what's going to be best for you with regards to MSPs, okay? Fantastic. Thanks so much, Glenn. Uh Awesome demonstration, fantastic Q&A, and really appreciate uh, the effort that you put into both uh, the SD-WAN orchestrator and Office 365. If you could hang out for just a little bit after your session um, to answer any remaining q and it'd be much appreciated. Uh, and with that, yes, um, great. Thanks for so much for the effort. And with that, I'll uh, turn this over now for our next session on the product update from Jason Poole. Jason, are you Thanks, with us? Dave. I am. And thank you very much, Glenn. Um, it was good. It was nice to see. Well, nice to see. But one of the things that's so important to our customers is the customer experience. On, and, and when they're using Office 365, it's not always perfect. The internet doesn't always work well. And that's like on the outbound. Intelligent traffic management. This is probably the most exciting product at Citrix right now, and I'm going to tell you why. So we did a session on this back in September. We went through you know, the technical this, that, and the other of it. But I just want to share with you some of the updates that we've got. But before I do that, I want to just address the why, because many people are new to this. So one of the things that we see, and Glenn so beautifully pointed it out, is that we're not always it's not always possible to rely on the internet. It's a huge unknown for application delivery. Sure, you can have the best data center and the fastest servers and you know the, the best cloud with the, the fastest interconnect or express route or whatever you want. But when, you're, when your users actually try to access it from their ISP from home and they're consuming your content, you can't control that. It becomes a big blind spot for application delivery. And there are all kinds of variables in latency and availability and throughput, and you just don't have control. So how do we then start to deliver internet-facing apps to our users and our consumers? It's a big issue. We're hearing this from a lot of customers. Every time we turn around and we talk to someone about it, and I don't just mean the workspace stuff. I mean the, the actual important applications that you as um, enterprises and small businesses are actually relying on to generate your revenue. It's not the sending out of email and the workspace and all that. It's how people interact with your company. How are they getting the best user experience? And we've learned that. We've learned that over 30 years. We've learned that from many hundreds of thousands of customers that experience is important. And that's why Citrix has done something about it. So what we do is we try to put back the visibility into the internet traffic. So what we do is we collect data 
from 900 million users every day across 50,000 different ISP networks measured um, to over 800 platforms of clouds and CDNs and stuff like that. And it results in 15 billion daily measurements of what the internet's actually like. And when we take that and we use machine learning and we manipulate it and we make some, some adjustments to it, and we basically create this virtual map of user experience across the internet. And that is cool. This is bigger data set than anybody else has got. Nobody, I mean, you could say Google probably get a get this many users a day, but actually, they just don't have this kind of variability. They're not testing all of the things that we're able to test. And so what we're looking at um, is the throughput, the, the latency, and the um, availability from each user wherever they are to a variety of different places. So we're able to take that information and then feed it into Citrix ITM and allow our customers, if they subscribe to that service, to use that information to select the best of their sites to send any particular user at any given instant in time to make sure that they can achieve that business continuity and deliver that superlative user experience. And that's pretty much it. Well, that's not it. There is more to it than that, of course. Um, it's not just the internet, of course. What we do is we take a lot more information from that. So we can take the awareness, we can take the, the information we're gathering, what we call real user measurements and passive uh, run measurements, as well as synthetic monitoring. So our ITM cloud, for want of a better word, or our global ITM platform is always testing our customer site. So if you subscribe to this service and you've got four or five different data centers or clouds or CDNs where your content is hosted, we can check and make sure that you, your users, wherever they're coming from, go to the one that's going to give them the best possible user experience. Because we're also feeding in things like application health. So we've managed to integrate feeds into this real-time decision-making engine from things like the Citrix ADC or any other application performance monitoring software that you have. And you can feed that into that uh, decision-making engine. You can even put in the business logic that you want to put in. It might be the e economics. If, for example, if you've got content that you're distributing and you're using one or more or multiple CDNs, then you might want to use, where possible, the cheapest one. You might not want to use, I'm not picking on them in particular, you might not want to use Akamai, except in cases where they're the only CDN that serves a certain area. You might say, I'm going to pick Fastly for this because it's cheaper for us, or something like that. So you actually start to feed this information in and mux it all up and come out with real-time decisions that can take the actions of sending, returning a DNS request or um, populating um, insights in, in the portal to give you alerts that something's happening you know, that's going to affect the distribution of your content. And that's what Citrix ITM is. And that's why I think it's the most exciting product that we do right now. More tangibly, although it's not quite tangible, what is it? It is a global platform. So it's got 95 points of presence all around the globe. And what happens when you're a customer of ITM is we can host your DNS resolution. And we're doing what GSLB used to do, or still does, but we're doing it, one, closer to the user, and two, much more intelligently. So we have this scalable platform that is built on 95 points presence, as I said, across five continents on four anycast networks. So you're never very far from a decision for your user. So a user trying to access your site of abc.com um, does not have to troll all the way across the world to your particular DNS servers to say the DNS address you need is here. So you've got to go back all the way across the world to actually make your request. And that is a very important thing. This starts to reduce that time to the first byte and engage your users more actively. Now I said, and I'll demonstrate this later, that it's what we're really introducing is GSLB as a service. So this is not just DNS as a service. We've been doing that for a long time. This is true global server load balancing as a service. Now, we can do that with um, 
the ability to have granular visibility of the internet as well as the health monitoring of the server components and the data center health and the application health. And from that, look for responses to state changes. So we can issue responses in to state to changes in state of either the internet or the servers or the application overall. And so what we start to get there is a really differentiated GSLB service. So you don't have to deploy things everywhere. It can work completely in the cloud with nothing to install and nothing to maintain. But if you're already using Citrix ADC or some other a application performance management tool, then you can feed this in for even better um, even better decision making. So we think of what we had before. You could either have GSLB done with uh, ADCs, or you could have, and that will sort of work out, you know, the best performing site that you've got right now, but not necessarily the closest site. Um, or it could look at using just the ITM stuff and give you the best performing site in terms of closest, in terms of uh, delay or best throughput. In fact. One of our largest customers relies on the traffic distribution from ITM to guide users, many millions of users every day or at least every month, to go and get new software. So there, they're looking for CDNs with the best throughput that's close to me or close to you. And then they also have a gaming service where they're looking for CDNs with the lowest latency for each of the users as they come in. And that latency, that CDN that's chosen today for me, it might be different tomorrow because the internet is a dynamic place and it changes all the time. What we're offering now is global server load balancing with added intelligence so that we can take that information about what's happening at the data center, feed it into uh, the information that's happening on the internet and come up with the best solution, the best decision about where to send your users to get your content. Okay, so that's, a basic overload. So I said I'd show you um, what the internet is like. So I, I, this is what we collect every day. And let me just fire this up here. It's on this piece here. And let me just do that and put this back. And we've got our live map of internet activity. So this is the radar live, we call it. And this is monitoring real-time internet anomalies. And you see each of these circles is something going wrong on the internet. It is a dangerous place. It is not a big, white, fluffy, friendly cloud. It is a collection of, let's say, cutthroat ISPs all looking to make a profit and peering with neighbors and friends or not peering. So the, the route that you take from A to B might not be the one that you're taking, the one you think you're taking, and therefore you might not get the best service. So what this is telling me is that, you know, if, if it's red, there's a severe problem. And if you just look along here in North Africa, there's severe problems. Earlier on, there was a lot of problems over the Western Europe. There's just a few in France now. You see you've got three major issues, four medium issues, and two minor issues. And the US is you know, not so bad. Florida's got a few medium, but I don't think there's any major, major, one major issue in the US. So what we can do here is we can actually see what these issues are. So for example, the CenturyLink SSL CDN has had an anomalous throughput decrease and an availability decrease to 2.5% from 96. And that's been witnessed by, for the last seven minutes, by a thousand users across six countries uh, from these particular networks. So this is people trying to get to the CDN in the US from all around the world and just not being able to do it. Similarly, we've got um, an ISP here. They've had latency, massive latency in increases. So this is the state of Arkansas Department of Information Systems. And they've seen this throughput decrease and availability decrease. Um, actually not by too much, but 98 to 96%. So it's not so bad, but that's for the last six minutes and it's affected 900 and, or nearly a thousand users across platforms. So this is something that gives you so much information about what's going on on the internet in real time to allow you to determine what's gonna happen and how's it gonna impact your delivery of your content. 
And so that brings me to my next piece. What we've added here is a, a visualizer. So as if, you know, as we move things to the to the cloud and we set up hybrid environments, or even if we set up new data centers, that's equally valid. We want to know where to put these data centers so we can start to monitor using real data-driven techniques to see um, what the best place is for any particular audience. So I think the best way to explain this is actually with an example. So I've set one up here. This could be Enterprise X, and they've got uh, a data center in the UK, and they've got a data center of some description in Japan. I've just picked AWS in the UK and SoftLayer in Tokyo. That's no reason for that. I just picked those at random. And what we're seeing here is across the globe, the average request duration is 365 milliseconds, which could kill most applications. Now, obviously, green is good, red is bad. So if you're in Europe, you're probably OK. So you can look for Ukraine, 200 milliseconds. France, it's about 141 milliseconds. And the UK, it's on average 100 milliseconds. So you know, it's a smallish country uh, in the UK, but this is the average um, time it takes to get to uh, the data and they would probably be sending them to the UK data center. So I've set this up as you know the, the geo proximity. So this is what you might have if you're utilizing GSLB on any of the ADCs today. Now, of course, if you're looking to do something else with this, you might say, well, I'm going to select an alternative scenario. And here I've added a data center in Australia and one on the east coast of the US. So we've seen bigger green areas, that's fine. We're still using Geo proximity, but you can see on average, this is reduced from 300 something milliseconds down to just less than 200. So this is good. We're moving ahead, but that means I have to install new data centers in, and I've just picked different clouds here. I can even fine tune this down. We saw it per country. If you're in the US, you can say, well, what is it for California? So I can look at California and I can say, well, you know what? 270 milliseconds, that might be enough for my needs. I can get a little bit more data. Um, here, and it's telling me, obviously, to the US place, it's the closest and further away to Sydney. So if you're doing geo proximity, you're not likely to send your users to Sydney. However, what happens if we switch on the ITM uh, manipulation of the data? So what we can see is immediately, when we do that, the DNS request is dramatically reduced, and the overall time drops down to 220 milliseconds. And that's great because now we're serving the best decision making from places that are closer to the user. So it's obviously much faster. They get to the site more quickly. They get that first byte of data, which keeps them engaged with your content much more fundamentally. You also notice when I switched here, so the problem with geo proximity, and Lord knows if you put this into round robin, it goes even worse, right? Everything's red. But if you're actually using geo proximity, you look here, and this is just one example. So um, Russia is red, but when we switch on ITM, ITM has the intelligence to say, you know what? Not everything in Russia needs to go to Japan. We can split this up. It's not all Europe. It's not all Asia. We can actually split this up, and we will tell um, users when they log in or when they try to access your content that this is actually the closest data center for them, not the one that's just because it's associated with their geo. And that's a really powerful tool when you start to think about how we're going to position content. So if, uh, for example, we have a customer who's based in the UK, they want to move stuff to the US, they want to attack that market, they're a gaming customer. So their markets are predominantly West Coast and East Coast. So they say, well, we'll put a data center on the East and a data center on the West. And we're actually able to look at this in, in more detail and say, well, does it make more sense to just put one in the middle? Is that going to suit your, your um, latency objectives more profoundly? So what this gives you is the ability to make business uh, data-driven business and investment decisions about where to place content and what it's going to be like for any particular audience, is it, or as that audience moves, you can get a new idea about what it's going to be like for them. So that's uh, the visualizer. I want to move on. Actually, I'm going to move back. Um, I'm going to just go, actually, I'm going to move on. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look into the ITM portal. So you can go and get this. By the way, this free-to-use website, 
I'll send you a link. You can go on, you can see what's happening in real time in internet. And there's a lot more things that you can click down here and it'll show you, you know, pick the one that you're using and say, oh man, that's pretty bad today or something like that. Um, and then this also free to use, you can come along, play with this. You can even put your own data center's IP address or your domain name in here and it should geolocate that um, automatically for you. And then you'll see what it's like. We're, we're simulating data, of course. Well, the data's real, but we're simulating um, the scenarios, of course. You can go further. You can create your own cloud portal account on ITM. So you can go to cloud.citrix.cloud.com, create an account, um, log in to um, Intelligent Traffic Management, or ITM, and then you'll get the portal come up. And you can do all this for free. Um, and that's called the Express Edition. Uh, and you can look into this and you can start to see a little bit more detail about what's going on on the platforms that you're interested in. So you know, the, this one, you can, you can assign anything you like. This one, you want to pin it down to the ones that are more interesting to you. So we've got Japan, we've got London. And so we can start to see, you know, for, for Tokyo, what's going on. Well, the availability has gone down by 55%. It's a medium severity. And the network that's doing that is Linode Lick or something like that. So you can go through and get a little bit more detail on here. Um, you can also add your own platform. So I've just got a few added here, but I've also got the, we've got the ability, if you're a Netscape or Citrix ADC user today, what you can do is you can take your configuration file and you can upload it into, I think it's this one, into ITM now and click upload and it will populate and geolocate your data centers based on their external IP address where we think they are and then you can start to look at the performance to them so in this example we've added in um, I think one private and two public uh, things in India and they're doing so there's an Azure and an on-prem and here uh, we've got a and I think that's an on-prem as well and we've also added in one in the US so this is a, a customer who's deployed in India and looking to move to the US. So they've deployed something on the east coast of the US. So as we switch these on, you start to get a view of what is the you know, user experience going to be. And so if we add more in India, does it improve or, or something like that? And we're just looking at average performance right now. That's the like the geolocation piece. If we actually put in best performance, then it makes a difference because if we go here, now all of a sudden we've got really good performance in the US and really good in India, but not so good around India. So what this tells us is that connectivity within India, fantastic. Connectivity outside of India to the neighboring countries, not so good. Right, um, so that's the visualizer. You can then set up alerts saying, these are my data centers. Tell me when ISPs are unable to reach those. And then that will send an alert to you and you know that you have um, something that's going to impact the distribution of your content. Great, so what I wanna do now is I'm actually gonna just share something with you, and that is uh, a demo. So we're gonna talk about this global server load balancing as a service. So I so said we used to, and we, we still do this, if you've got no ADCs or anything like that, we can do GSLB using internet conditions. We've always been able to do that. But we're now gonna integrate the Citrix ADC into that decision-making process. And another thing I didn't mention is that when you're doing this, the algorithms you decide to use are yours. You're not restricted to the algorithms given to you by an ADC vendor for GSLB. And that might be round trip time, or it might be health of this, or geo uh, location of that. You can craft this as granularly as you want. So what we're going to be doing, I've got a simple example here. I have three Citrix ADCs, one in Europe, one in the US, one in Asia. And behind each one are two web servers. And they these feed information in, I think we've set it to be every minute, into the ITM decision making. And I'm here in Europe. So I'm making a call. It's going to ITM and it's saying, where should I go to get this content? So the first thing that ITM is doing is it's saying, is the site reachable? So that's the, um, the synthetic monitoring that we've got. And if it's not, we remove that from the pool that we can choose from. 
And is the site at 100% health? So we're looking at the load balancing here and saying, how healthy is the site behind it? There's no point in sending me to a site that's down after all, no matter how close it is. And if it's down, if it's not 100%, we're removing it from the pool. And after that, we start to look and see, well, which site has the best response, the best RTT? And then we send back a list of those sites or just one of those sites. So you'd think, I'm in Europe, I'm going to get the EU site. That makes sense. And it's pretty true. So let's go back in here and let me just switch into the demo here. And it's this one here. Okay, so what we've done is we've set up what we call um, fusion feeds. And as I said, we've got the fusion feeds from three net scalers uh, across the globe, and they're fronting a web form of, uh, I think there might be Apache servers at the back end, it doesn't really matter. So what we're doing now is we're starting to feed information in to ITM service every minute. And you can see every minute it's actually making a request and it's pulling all these items from Nitro. And these are the, the items that are pulling and the actual number to that. So what we're looking at in this, this simple example is we're looking at the V server load balancing health. And we're seeing because everything's up, it's 100. And if it does that, then we start to look at what the actual response time is. So this is what we're pulling back. And I say, you could set this to be, to be pushed when there's a change, but for now, we're just setting it to pull. And so when I look at what, we, what we're actually retrieving, so for me right now, it's saying that I should go to my closest one. This is gonna give me, go to this one, the web server, the EU web server, and then following that, go to the US, and following that, go to the Asia Pac one, and that's based on the RTT 45, 113, and 240 milliseconds. So that's great. Everything's, everyone's happy. Now, <clears throat> if I click into here, no doubt I'll have to log in again. Um, it will have logged me out for sure. Yep. So let's log back in. This seems to be pretty standard practice for masterclass demos. So we put this in, this should log me in again. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, um, real demo gods would go back and turn off one of the Apache servers or cause a failure. I'm gonna simulate that using um, the load balancing service and disabling the um, one of the servers at the back end. And I don't care if it's graceful or not. So then that will go out of service. And so now what's happening is we're still polling that, um, those three net scalers. And what will happen is each time we poll it, excuse me, each time we poll it, each time we poll it, we'll be getting this information. Excuse me, David, just a second. Oh, no worries. Love a live demo and a live audience. So. <laughs> This has been fantastic so far. I appreciate really the the uh, you know, going the the extra mile and showing us the live information. This has been uh, fantastic and exciting so far. Thanks, Dave. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> They've been quiet all day <laughs> and now, <laughs> just now. Okay, I do apologize. Um, I'm human. They're dogs. This happens. Right. Moving on. Okay. So each time it polls and comes back, it's saying it's a site reachable is the site 100% and so on. So when we go back in and we look at the answers now, the good thing is that should have filled some time, we start to see that actually now I'm being directed to the US site. Even though I've got a round trip time that's worse than my EMEA site, it's sending me there because the it's calling the EMEA site unavailable because the vServer health is not 100. So that's very simple. Okay, this is what we've done, and, and it's incredibly simple, um, just to make the point. But if you think of what you could do with this, right? So you, all of a sudden, we've got all this information, all this fusion feed, this data that we're feeding in from the from the net scaler, and this could be anything. You could be choosing it based on the the health of the application. You could be choosing it on the number of connections that you've received. You could be choosing it on the throughput. 
that's actually going through the device at any one time because you want to de deliver your users to the best site for them to get the best experience. That's the goal. That's the goal that you have for your customers and your consumers. That's the goal that we have to make this better for you. So you can do this with Citrix ADC. You can do this with um, basically any third-party data set. We can ingest that. And then we can add this to the decision making that we do. And you define the decision making. It's you that writes the, pro the protocols that you're using, the algorithms that you're using. You're not restricted to what Citrix gives you or any other ADC vendor. And it's not just based on um, DNS. You can do this with HTTP calls as well. So there's a full API on this on ITM. So this, for example, might be for a video customer who's delivering video across um, multiple CDNs to get it close to their customers, and they're saying, okay, I'm logging in, and my closest site to get this video is site one. And so I start to stream it from site one, and then after a few minutes, I make another request through an HTTP call, an HTTP API call to the ITM saying, okay, is site one still the best site for me? And site one isn't anymore. So now it says, now I want you to go and get your content from site two. So seamless to the user, I'm now going to stop pulling my video content from site one. I'm going to pull it from, content from site two. But the buffer that's in the video already means that I don't even notice that. And that can be dis decided on the performance of the video, of course, but also on the cost. And so you know, there are very large sporting events that go out live all over the world and also in the US. And they're starting to use this type of technology to make sure that their users get the right um, the right experience. OK, so that's the demo over. I'm going to wrap this up with just a couple more things here. That ITM, it is a cloud service. I showed you it's a platform. There are three editions, like all the other Citrix cloud services, standard, advanced, and premium. In standard, we start to focus on the visualization of what that content can do and how it can impact your delivery of, of content. And also, we bring in the GSLB data input from, from various sources, but only from actually from Citrix sources. Uh, and then we have the advanced. Uh, this is where you actually start to utilize the information and, and connect all of the, the fusion feeds in or the API calls in to uh, ITM to make better decisions. And then in premium, this is where we start to talk about controlling those interactive applications. I don't mean web applications. I mean things like that where you're controlling the client in case they might want to make that HTTP call. So <clears throat> that's the basics of it. There is more details uh, on this slide in the feature list. These are all the different features you get and how long we host the data. And interestingly, the other thing that this will do, and I think this is available in standard, is something that we used to call impact. But every time someone visits your site and they download content, then we start to see uh, and report back to you what that experience was really like. So how long it took for each of the items to download on the page, how long the page took to render. And then we can start to feed that back and into you for, for analysis. And you can start to see, OK, I need to make my website load faster. Maybe I should maybe cut down the, the amount of content I'm sending. Or you know, it's working really well on. Uh, Safari, but it's not working so well in Chrome, or it's not working so well on Edge, or something like that. So you can start to fine tune these types of things as well. So I would say to you, take a look at these slides. Go and check the data sheet. I put some placeholders in here for where we did the demo, so you can go and look at the performance visualizer and the radar live. And with that, I will pause for breath and ask Dave if there are any questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jason, and really appreciate the effort and the, the live demos, too. So uh, there was a couple questions, um, <laughs> some funny and, uh, and otherwise. <laughs> so one of them is, can you list the live site again, or do you have the name of the live site? Sure. Let me just put that back up. Um, quick play. There we go. So now you should see it's live.sodexus.com. That will be transferring, I think, to itm.cloud.com slash live. But for now, just go to live.sodexus.com. 
Fantastic. And on a lighter note, what's the name of the dog? <laughs> We're sure it's there are boy. two of them. <laughs> there are two of them. There's Jago and Ruby, and they're Rhodesian Ridgebacks, and they're not behaving well today. <laughs> but they are lovely. I'm going to forgive them. <laughs> they sound fantastic, and they were they they were quick to quiet. <laughs> yes, I threw them out. Okay, thanks fantastic. very much. Thanks so much, Jason. All right, so uh, thanks so much, Jason. So now we're going to move into the the final stretch of the masterclass webinar, and this is where we go over what's new, uh, what do we see happening, as well as uh, the final uh, part, which is our grand prize giveaway. So what's new? There's been a few blogs written recently about networking at Citrix, and one of them uh, most re recently is from Jason himself. And it's a pretty good succinct blog. So if you heard some of his presentation on the product update, or perhaps you'd just like to get some more information, more than what you just saw, or perhaps you'd like to review uh, some of the content that he saw, Jason writes a, a good blog and a good article about you know, how to go about uh, diagnosing the problems in your network and what you can do to try to get the uh, take advantage of the next generation of GSLB that we provide with the Citrix ITM. So if you're interested in getting more information uh, that Jason spoke about or going deep on whether ITM is a great product for you, perhaps even just trying it out, seeing some of that live data that Jason showed and shared with us today, then please uh, check out this blog and go through it because there's a lot of information there that he reveals as well as a lot of links that you can click on to go deeper and get information for yourself to see whether the Citrix ITM product will add value for you in your GSLB and multi-data center type of location services. So what else are we doing uh, more recently? So coming up this month, and in fact, next week is Google Next in San Francisco. So if you happen to be someone joining us in San Francisco, feel free to drop by. Citrix will have a booth. We'll be there. Yours truly, Dave Potter, will also be in the booth on Tuesday next week. So feel free to stop by, say hi. If you're um, not attending the Google Next next week, which I expect most of you would not be, and please check out the blog because we've got quite a bit going on with Google. We've got a new uh, product that's being deployed in the Google Cloud, and Citrix is actually a partner of Google. So in this blog, uh, Vivian Lou Palumbo describes some of the different things that Citrix is doing with Google, including uh, Citrix networking, as well as the other portfolio products that Citrix has from an enterprise-wide standpoint including, you know, why is Citrix going into Google Cloud to begin with? So very good information there. I invite you to check out this blog. And if you're in San Francisco next week, please drop by the booth and say hi. It's always fun to see you there. So what else is, is coming up or has been happening? So um, back in February, uh, if you were lucky enough to join us on the Networking Masterclass in February, we had a very large deep dive on cloud native networking. And this is what Citrix is doing in all the cloud native features and software like Kubernetes and what we're doing in cloud native with software as a service type vendors. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about what Citrix is doing there or to get a recap or to understand what we're doing going forward, you may have heard about the recent acquisition by a competitor of a free open source product. Well, Citrix has some pretty good things to answer with that. And I think you'll find a lot of that information in the blog. So I'm not going to reveal a lot of details here. I just have to say that we've got a lot that we're doing in cloud native networking in specifically Kubernetes. And if you're interested to, to learn about more of what we're doing coming up in the next several months, I invite you to read the two blogs shared here by Komal, our uh, senior product manager on cloud native networking written just this month. So coming up just around the corner is our customer event, Citrix Synergy. It'll be in Atlanta, Georgia. So I invite you, if you have not already registered, to go ahead and check out CitrixSynergy.com, see if it's a good event for you, and to register. If you're lucky enough to have registered, we would love to see you at the event, especially in the expo hall where our customers and our customer experience members will be. So yours truly, again, will be available and in the booth at our customer experience 
Experience Center and the Expo Center. I would love to see anyone from the webinar to come by and say hello. Uh, also, in addition to that, we'll have a number of demo stations available to share not only what we're doing uh, in terms of what we shared on the webinar today, but what we've done uh, in a number of webinars previous as well and going forward. So not just cloud native networking, not just ITM, we'll also be sharing what we're doing in terms of gateway and the entire wide Citrix networking portfolio. So I invite you to go to CitrixSynergy.com, visit it, see if it's a good event for you, register, and we would love to see you and have you join us at the event. So what else is going on? So we've mentioned this on every webinar. Um, I still find content and I still speak to people that don't know the new name for Citrix ADC or uh, the new name uh, should what was formerly NetScaler. Um, so, you know, it still goes without saying the product names have moved forward. We have a new unified name in the product portfolio. And if you're familiar with the NetScaler product line and that defines your products, that's great. The same products exist, but it's now under the new name of Citrix ADC. Similarly, our Citrix VPN service, SD-WAN and Gateway is now the Citrix SD-WAN and Citrix Gateway respectively. So if you're using these products, the actual products do not change one bit. The only difference is that we're now referring to them under the new portfolio names with Citrix. And we think it helps align the brand a little bit better, emphasizing that the ADC, Web Application Firewall, and Gateway really derail from the same product family, not just NetScaler, but the Citrix product family, enabling these products to have the tight integration that they already exist under the different name schema. So um, thank you for joining on this masterclass. Before I say adieu, uh, I just want to let you know that we have our next webinar starting on the 1st of May, 2019. And in the spotlight, it will have just one section on spotlight. It'll be a big one. And it's on what's new with Core ADC. And this is in specifically release 13. So this is our brand new release with the Citrix ADC for 2019. Joining us will be product managers Pankaj and Vinod. Uh, they're uh, extremely knowledgeable on the new features, and I'm very happy and excited for them to share all the enhancements that we're introducing with version 13 that you can take advantage in the changing landscape of networking. All right, so now it's time for the, the favorite part of my section, which is okay. the prize giveaway. Yes, Jason, go ahead. Okay. Just before we do that, um, I'm getting a lot of questions here. Sure. I'd like to just quickly run a poll, if I may, just for 30 seconds. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone else about ITM, but if you want me to reach out to you, just click yes in the box, and I will gladly drop you an email and find out more details about what you want to do and what you want to learn, and I'll happily link you in with the right people at Citrix, and as well as answering things myself. So if you just click yes, I'll get in touch with you over the next few days, and we can talk more about it. And I'll also maybe try to invite you to some of the ITM-specific master classes that we're running on the second Thursday of each month. OK, so thank you. Sorry to interrupt, but um, if you've got five more seconds, then we'll just close that poll, and I'll make contact with people. Thank you very much. Awesome. Love to have it. Thanks, Jason, and love to have that jump in. So if you weren't paying attention, <laughs> You are now. So uh, thanks uh, for answering the poll, and thank you, Jason. So with that, uh, the prize giveaway. So if you are paying, this will be a question uh, from our session today from one of the three sections that we had, whether Glenn Williams delivered it or from Jason. The, 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 the choice is random. So with that in mind, I'm going to bring up the question. To answer the question, I appreciate if you would be kind enough to type the answer into the Q&A panel. I think in the past we've deviated a little bit, whether it's chat or Q&A. We prefer to have it go into the Q&A. It's just a little bit easier for us to follow uh, when you answer the question. All right, so with that, the grand prize giveaway today is a Nest Hello, and the winner will be whoever answers this question the quickest. So before I answer the question or ask the question, I just ask that if you've answered the question correctly within the last six months, I would appreciate if you would just yield and hold back just a little bit in order to give the opportunity to someone new to the webinar or someone to the new to the masterclass to have the opportunity to win the prize. Okay, with that, the question is, 
the Citrix SD-WAN orchestrator enables an amount of blank touch provisioning. And you would, uh, the blank could be the name or the amount between zero and infinity. So what I'm looking for is the first person to come up with the answer between zero and infinity. And this one came in fairly quick. All right, so we do have a winner. Uh, the winner is Karen P. So Karen, we'll follow up with you following the webinar. Thanks so much for the very quick answer and very much appreciate, uh, <laughs> you know, it's always exciting to see how many people are actually listening and willing to type in and come up with the answer so quick. So thank you for listening and we appreciate uh, the quick diligence and the answer. So the answer for this question, if you did not answer correctly, is zero or the number zero touch provisioning. All right, with that, that brings us to the end of another fantastic networking masterclass. And it remains only to thank the fantastic crew of presenters for their time and for sharing with us today. So thank you, Glenn Williams, and thank you, Jason Poole. And of course, thank you to our audience for sticking around and for making this so much of a fun session with your questions. I'm Dave, and until next time at the beginning of May, goodbye.